Welcome to Malcolm Reed's How to Barbecue Right, a podcast where we talk about barbecue, share recipes, and discuss all things delicious. And now here's your host, Malcolm and Rochelle Reed. Hey, welcome back to the How to Barbecue Right podcast. I'm your host, Malcolm Reed, and joined by my lovely, talented wife, Miss Southern Shell, right across from me. We got Tyler over here on the board, full crew today. How are y'all doing? Good, good. Awesome. It's not it's not really fall weather today. I keep it warmed back up. It. Yeah, I know. And it was fall last weekend. Man, I had a blast. <laughs> Uh, chili weather. Yeah, we did chili. Are we you, talked all about it last week, all about chili doing it. You know we had to. Are you chilled out at this point? I don't even know if there's a such thing as chilled out. Can you get chilled out? Can you get chilled out? <laughs> I mean, hey, we had a whole, we made a big pot of chili last week, and I finished it off yesterday. Well, see, we had several people asking about how do you, what do you do with leftover chili? It gets better as the days go That's on crazy. to me. But we have vacuum sealed. I mean, chili freezes, believe it or not, it freezes really, really good. It freezes beautifully. Yeah. And if you vacuum seal it in a bag, it stacks really good. I mean, you got to be a little tricky working your vacuum sealer to get it to. So how do you vacuum seal a liquid? So first, like for chili, we, you know, chili is not really soupy. <laughs> I said, I stated that last week. So once you let it cool, it's pretty thick. Yeah. And it goes down in a vacuum seal bag. What the the trick is, you got to keep the bag seal clean. So if you'll double it over a couple times to where when you unroll it, it's nothing ever could have touched on it. Yeah. You can kind of put a fold in it and put it in your vacuum sealer bag. And then once you get it in there and start sealing it, let it unfold to where there's it'll suck air up. And then I just hit stop right before it starts drawing it up in there. There's no, I mean, ain't no trick to it. No, that's how not. I do it. That's, and I, I mean, we use a vacuum saver. I mean, it's a what food saver is a brand. I do have one of those Wesson ones, but I usually we just bust out the vacuum saver. Yeah, it's harder food to pull saver. the Wesson one out. It's heavier. It's heavier. Yeah. It's if you're doing a lot of stuff, that Wesson one comes in handy. Oh, yeah. Like we use that on big jobs where we're sealing and you got to seal bags after seal bags after seal bags because a food saver, if you do five or six seals, you got to let that thing cool off. It yeah. can't handle it. I've overheated a bunch of them. You got to take your time. But just for doing stuff at the house, it's perfect. And it's lightweight, you know. How do you seal it? You might have a technique that I don't know. That's exactly how That's I how do, you do it. You just got to watch it so you don't start sucking chili up. So they've got this container that comes with something with the fancier food savers, and it's got a lid with a little suction valve on it, and you put the little hose on that, but I've never really even used that. Well, you, you got to use their Tupperware. You know, it yeah. only works with that Tupperware. So. And you always need a big bowl for chili. Yeah. We keep downsizing it. Like when The first day will be a big bowl with the big Tupperware bowl. And then after you eat on it again the next day, it goes down to another Tupperware bowl. And then it works all the way down to where there's like one cup left. And that's what I got to yesterday. We just leave it in the big bowl the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I'm not yeah, doing yeah. that many yeah. dishes. It takes, a, it takes up so much room in the refrigerator. <laughs> I hate, I hate, there's nothing like a big old giant Tupperware bowl in the refrigerator. It's crowding everything and there's just a little bit of something in it. I can't stand that. <laughs> just go ahead and knock it out. You can only eat so much chicken. Like a bowl a day is like my limit. But that's what I've been having for lunch. Like I'll go home and eat a, a bowl of chili for lunch. We did uh, some, we smoked some big hot dogs. What kind of hot dogs were those? Those, I think they were Hebrew National, quarter pound, all beef. They're huge. Oh, yeah. You only get like five of them in a pack. Yeah. But they are the best chili four. dog. Man, it's a, it's a chili dog when you put one of those on a bun. It hangs off the bun. On, instead of having more bread. You actually get your hot dog ratio right with those, and you don't have room for a lot of chili. You got to smother it on, you know, put it on a plate or something. This ain't no pick them up and eat them chili dog. This is get you a fork and maybe a knife. But a smoked quarter pound all beef hot dog is mighty dang good. How do you smoke your hot dogs? Man, it's real hard. <laughs> you first, you take them out of the refrigerator and bust the pack open, and you put them on the pit about 250 for about 30 minutes. That's all it takes. You don't want them to bust, you want them to sweat really good. You kind of get the outer skin kind of where it's starting to get tight. But if you go too long, they'll all bust open on you. I like to roll them, too, because yeah. we do them on the pellet grill usually. Just because th- it's so easy. Just mm-hmm. fire it up, throw them on there. But um, it'll actually get the grill marks on that pellet grill if you'll roll it yeah. a little. You start them out at the front, just kind of rolling dogs. So I pulled the hot dogs off the pit and set them on the bar by the chili. That was the first round. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I was like, all right, you know, chili dogs are ready. Everything's ready. And about that time, I turned back around, 
and the dog was licking her lips. She ate, she ate three of them in like a matter of seconds. <laughs> so how many pounds of? That's a, it's a quarter pound. Three quarter pounds, yeah. <laughs> she enjoyed them. You had to, you were mad. You had to cook another pack of hot dogs. You yeah. went through another one out there because you didn't get one. I luckily I had already made me one. Like I was waiting on the dog to get done. I think Michael had made him like a Frito chili pie, and yeah. I don't even know if you got anything, did you? Not that round. Yeah. And so I ate one, and then. You set the prep. She was like, that looks so good. So I guess there's only four in a pack. There's only one, four in a pack. Yeah, that's a one-pound yeah. pack of. And it's expensive. It's an expensive pack of hot dogs. Five or six bucks. Only having four in there. Yeah, but they're worth it. It's like the big hot dog that Sam sells, like for the dollar fifty hot dog combo. It's, it's almost like, I mean, it's the size of a sausage. Yeah, it is. Have you um, tried those, Tyler? The big ones? I mean, I've had like a Costco dog or Sam's yeah. Club yeah. dog or whatever. Yeah. They're really you can good. buy them at Kroger. Bougie hot dogs are the best. Like, I agree. Not, they're worth the money. I, I mean, so. the little red dog's pretty good, too. But. They make a mean chili dog. <laughs> uh, m- uh, Friday, you did a rib demo in Cleveland, we Mississippi. We did. We went to Oktoberfest, and it wrapped up um, the barbecue, the Delta barbecue battle. Got to give a shout-out to my man, Marcio. Uh, his team, Hog Addiction, won. Uh, I want to say they won first place in Hog and in either shoulder or ribs at this contest. But he he had the most points in the battle. However, they added all that up and uh, won an extra ten grand. So That's pretty he had day. a good weekend. Yeah. But we went down on Friday and um, did two rib demos. I think we had about. You know, right at twenty in each class or something like that. It was it was it was a real fast class. They were only like an hour scheduled an hour long. It was actually forty five minutes. Was it forty five minutes? You just kept going over. I just kept going. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna field questions as long as there's questions. And it always starts out we did it about ribs. And I got to pick what ribs it did. So I wanted to pick a rib that meant something to me, that was a good eating rib, that was totally not competition, you know. It wasn't all that stuff that goes into a competition rib. So I showed them how to make a Memphis style dry rib the way I do it. And it was, those ribs those were out really, really good. good. Yeah. So how did y'all cook them? So Mark, he went down because he was cooking the contest. He went, actually went down Thursday night. So he got up Friday morning and put on, I think we cooked 18 racks of baby back ribs and he put them on that morning. And it was, I mean, you know, put them on the outlaw. Yeah. Cooked them on an the outlaw stick burner, uh, with some hickory wood. We used, I mean, not simple, simply took the membranes off and seasoned them with hot rub. And this was a no wrap rib. Uh, when we do them dry style, we just run them at 275 to the internal temperatures about 202. You know, you don't have to run them up to 210 cause you're not speed cooking them. And it still takes about four and a half hours right at, um, we and did wrap those. Well, they wrapped them at the end, yeah. just a hole, and then he took them back off. No, and... we were worried they weren't going to get done. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Well, you were. Well, that's not the technique I taught. <laughs> I taught, do not wrap them. Let them roll. We were worried they weren't going to get, or Mark was worried they were, weren't going to yeah. get done. He's like, oh, we're fixing to wrap these. So he hey, wrapped sometimes them. you go to How long did he wrap calls. them? Oh, like the last hour and a half. Oh, okay. Well, that's a normal wrap job then. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess, last hour, yeah. hour and a half. I mean, sometimes you gotta make those kind of calls. Sometimes you do. If it, if they ain't getting tender, that's a surefire way to break out the old crutch and get them tender. I that's did not know old. all that. Yeah. <laughs> you were do you were doing your. <laughs> I thought y'all stuff. had them wrapped because you just wanted to tend them and then hold them for a little bit and then bring them out and put a little more dry rub on them because when I served them, that's the way they were. Yeah. So. It was just a last minute. Yeah, call to get them done. Yeah. They were super tender. Yeah, I mean, this was these were ones when we were doing demo. Mark was taking the bones out and showing them how you can pop a bone out and pick it up and then slide the bone back in and break it and it all still stay on the bone. We we showed them all the little tricks of that. We um served it. Everybody got like a nacho boat, like you get nacho chips. Yeah, you know, and we put sauce in the little nacho side, <laughs> and then you got a roll and a couple bones of ribs. There was plenty because we had people come back for seconds. Yeah, when they you know we had plenty of ribs. We also served a little appetizer when everybody first came in and sat down. We did a little, a little Memphis-style cheese plate. You got, well, actually, you got pimento cheese, and then you got some smoked sauces that we did. It was country-pleasing sausage seasoned up, and then you got some some of our spicy garlic pickles and some crackers. So yeah. you kind of build your own little sausage and cheese appetizer. It was a mini sausage and cheese appetizer. Yeah. yeah. Which, do you think that that is like the quintessential Memphis 
appetizer. Uh, when you go, it's hard to not go to a Memphis restaurant and see a sausage and cheese plate. Yeah. I don't even care if it's a bar. Most of the bars have that on there. Um, they don't, not many of them serve it with pimento cheese. A few do. A few that are in the know. Most of it's just cubed up cheddar. You know, or or there might be a pepper jack and cheddar mix or something like that. And that's fine too. Any kind of cheese, as long as you got cheese, it's good. But try it with pimento cheese. Pimento cheese goes great with it. Smoked sausage pimento cheese stacked up on a cracker, topped with a spicy pickle. That's a heck of a bite. They call that redneck sushi. I've heard it called that. But that was a good time. They had a great contest down there. I got to do light in the grill. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler, I wish you could have seen this. So they blowed it all up. Like, okay, it's the biggest, you know, we, we got to start this contest off. We're going to call out every team, and every team comes up and puts one brick at on the grill. And, you know, after all 50 teams or how many other teams were there would do it, the, the, the person they designate as the official grill lighter starting the contest off gets to light this grill. And I was like, man, that's a pretty good honor, you know? You know? I had, like, this idea. Have you ever watched the Olympics, the opening yeah. of the Yeah, Olympics? they like the big cauldron. <laughs> yeah. and fire. That's kind of what I was imagining. You know, there's going to have something like that set up. Something permanent right there. Or at <laughs> so, least a big king. So drink. they kept telling me, yeah. like, oh, we're going to get this grill. It ain't out here yet. We're going to get it out here. We're going to get this grill out here. And I was like, okay. And then one dude started saying, all right, now, how do you feel about shooting this flamethrower? Because you don't want to get too close to it. We've been soaking it in mat- in uh I've been soaking match light charcoal with lighter fluid all day is what he told me. And they wanted me to, sh- but they didn't want me to burn the crowd because they had this flamethrower. And the whole time I'm like, this don't sound right right here now. <laughs> I don't know if they're messing with me or what. So when it finally comes down to it, Tyler, I go over there behind the stage where they got this grill. And this is one of those, it was a Kingsford grill, but I swear it might've been. It was a dollar general special. Yeah. It might've been 12 inches by eight inches. It wasn't much bigger than a legal pad. <laughs> And it was on the ground and had this little bitty leg thing sitting on it. So it might have held it a half inch off the ground. <laughs> and, and they had it slapped full of a bag of charcoal and it put lighter fluid all over it. And then they let everybody else put a briquette on it. <laughs> and so it was a, and then I had to light it. So they were like, don't burn yourself. Don't burn yourself. So, <laughs> so I got my aim of flame. I bent over it and stuck it to it. Ta-da. <laughs> Did it catch when you lit? Oh yeah, I mean it had enough lighter, but it wasn't like no bonfire. Yeah. I was expecting that. that's fire, you know. <laughs> Roll a little Malky around over there. So <laughs> I was expecting something like that. I was looking for the flavor. I was like, this can't be it, right? We could have done this in like an aluminum to go pan, <laughs> yeah. you know. That's essentially what it was. That's what it was. Legs. It was like an aluminum pan that they had put some little legs on, and then the kicker was somebody won it. I, th- I think uh, Jacob from New Bonds yeah, won it. Yeah, he did. And then he had to take it with him. But the whole thing with that was Elise told me, she said, you know why I do this and give it away? So I ain't got to mess with it. They can take it and they clean it up. So, <laughs> so they do that with next year. We're going to work on that yeah. grill for them. You might have gave away your secrets. Yeah. <laughs> might have gave away your secret. Nobody's going to show up to it next time. She's going to be stuck with that. I don't even know. That charcoal would have probably burned through that grill if you would have let it burn. Yeah. There's a lot of charcoal in some thin metal. I don't know if it'd stand up to that. They were trying to put the lid on it. Yeah, Doc did. He put the lid on it, and then it flashed back on him, so he had to get something and kind of close off the one little vent on it, and off they went with it. I'm picturing that little, like, cardboard grill that we did that out the smoke It's video. not much different than that. <laughs> yeah. You can make that out of thin metal. That's great. I kept looking, and Malcolm's like, it's right there. I was yeah. like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not saying I was like, it. maybe they got to put it together. Maybe it's in a <laughs> box somewhere. Where's, maybe they're pulling it in behind this car or truck. That's what I was waiting on. I was like a pit. It's going to be firing up the pit, you know. What is, what's that really big Weber? Is that a King the Ranch? Rancher. The yeah, Rancher. Yeah, the King Ranch or whatever. It's the Ranch. I don't know. That might be a Ford truck or something. But. Yeah, King Ranch <laughs> is, but it's the ran- Weber Ranch kettle. Okay. It's huge. That would, Those things aren't cheap. Like 400 No, I think like 1000 bucks. Yeah, gone for a Weber. For a Weber, yeah, it's pretty high. Now, that'd be a giveaway. <laughs> yeah, that would be a good one to get. Um, have you seen this Renegade Ranch Roll? Have you seen that? I saw people talking about it on Facebook. Man, it looks good. So Colorado Craft, they do a lot of um, meat. I yeah. guess they do a lot of cattle. Um, you've seen their logo probably Yeah, everywhere. Anyway, um, do you want to explain it? From what I saw, it was it's basically a side of D-bone beef. Like the side of a cow. And it included all the big cuts. Like it had your ribeye, your 
loin. Let me tell you all the short cuts. rib. Yeah, tell me all the cuts that was in the side of this beef. So you get a little chuck, you get a little ribeye and rib, you get the tenderloin and the New York strip, the sirloin, and that's your top row. Uh-huh. And then coming back, you get a little tri tip, a little flank, a little short rib and skirt, and the brisket. So it's basically like they it peeled sh- off. They peeled off. Bo- it's totally boneless, but I guess they peel it off right at the bone level. And it just looks like a side, like, and it's as it looked like it was six foot long, like mm-hmm. long as a table, long as a and cow. And they had it seasoned <laughs> up, yeah, long as a cow. Imagine it, long <laughs> as a side. Of the, you take that middle section of a cow and just peel him down. Yeah, you got a sheet of beef, and I guess they seasoned it and rolled it up and tied it, and cooked it almost uh, like a porchetta, you know, that you do yeah. with a, a pig belly bacon side. Same way. And they and it, kept it nice and medium yeah, rare, it, nice and Man, rare. and so when I saw it and they're toting it in, I'm like, man, you got all them good cuts. This isn't going to be good. It's going to be dried out, overcooked. And then they sliced it, and you could see in the video, I'm serving it to people, that meat looks so perfectly like medium rare and tender. I and I was like, oh, that's when I wanted some of it. It looked really, really good. I want, do they sell that? Like, you can buy that? Because it'd probably be on the video, several hundred dollars. Yeah, it said you can have a... A renegade ranch roll for your next event or so you can us. buy it? i don't know if they're like just doing the catering or you actually can buy the whole roll if we yeah. can buy that whole roll yeah i need to ask like como if he can cut that <laughs> down at home place pastures can you can you cut this i just need a, you to shave that with that one right yeah there. i mean you think it would be awesome would you do it yeah i definitely would do it I mean, didn't see what they cooked it on, did you? Cause uh-uh, because they pulled it out of like a holding. It looked like a cooler. Yeah, you know? yeah. I they, imagine it was on a rotisserie. So probably. it could spin and cook even or something, or you'd have to roll it to keep it cooking even like that. But, I mean, that's, you got to gotta get it to cook. You need some really good heat source to get it to cook even all the way across it. You don't think it was like a stick burner? Or- I, I don't know. I mean, I'd try it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you, you start with like a small portion of one. Yeah, I was going to say a, a small portion would work. But, you know, you kind of get all the good parts like a prime rib. Yeah. But you get the option to season inside, which you can't do that with a prime rib. So I guess you could unroll a prime rib like that and then yeah. roll it back up and slice it. Have you ever thought about doing that? I mean, I've never, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, like jelly rolling a, prime, a whole ribeye. I've seen people do it where they take the cap off. And, you know, so you got the cap, and then you roll yeah. the cap up. So and that's really good. Make, you make, and, But typically when they roll the cap up and tie it, they cut it into medallions, and then so you got these steaks of ribeye cap or spinalis steaks. Yeah. They sell are, those at Costco. Yeah, they used to. I don't think they do anymore. Or I hadn't seen them in a long time. They're pretty good. They were. The only bad thing about it, when I bought those at Costco – is they had all the string in them, and the string was throughout it. So you were constantly pulling out little bits of string as you were eating the thing. I was like, I don't know why they did it like that. Why not just put one string on it? But that was a little strange. It's a lot of string holding it together. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will say that I found the best cheese grater. I'm, I'm real big on grating your own cheese. Yeah, because the bag cheese has that coating on it, and, yeah. and it won't melt. And I'm... I'm the first to like to skip steps in a, in a recipe. I'll buy some frozen onions, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to skip steps. But to me, fresh grated cheese melts better, tastes better, does better. Like when you're making pimento cheese, there's no bag cheese Heck in it. No. It won't cream. It won't get creamy. Because of the starch on the outside or whatever it is yeah. they put on the outside of the cheese to keep it from sticking in the package? Because if you bought a package of shredded cheese, you wouldn't want it to be all stuck together. And that's what's going to happen if it don't have that on it. Um, I have seen some people like rinse it and it rinse that coating off, supposedly. But yeah, I don't want to wash my cheese. I know. That seems like if wash I'm going to rinse cheese. it, I might as well just grate it. Yeah. I'm just trying to wash everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wash your chicken and wash your cheese. You're washing all the cheesy goodness off. But I can't imagine some more wet cheese, can you? I know. Then you got to have wet cheese. Yeah. Yeah. You gonna, how are you going to dry the cheese after you wash it? You got a cheese spinner, like the old salad <laughs> spinner that you crank? Doesn't. Grated cheese is best. So tell me about this best box grater in the world. I saw you using this contraption, and I was like, what is this? I was like, this is the best. I've had a lot of cheese graters, and they always, like, they move too much. They get clogged. They uh, knock knock off and 
get your knuckle. A knuckle buster. That's yeah. what my mom always called them, the old knuckle buster. This one is a three-sided. It's got feet, so it's got elevation so it doesn't get clogged. And it's got this big knob at the top. So uh, I actually looked them up. They're three-sided uh, cheese graters, but they will stay st- firm and still while you're grating cheese, and they don't move and wiggle and stuff, and they don't get clogged. It's got a ergonomic candle where you don't it's hurt your a- hand holding on to it. I just thought it might uh, be a tip to pass on there to you go. fellow cheese graters out there. When I saw that thing, I was like, well, looks like somebody done found something at a yard sale. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where it came from? It's missing a whole side. <laughs> <laughs> it's practically brand new. I'm betting it was a pampered chef. Somebody sold it at their yard sale, and either you or your mama found it out. One day I was out, y'all were out doing something while I was down at the farm. That's exactly, I don't know if it was a pampered chef brand, but yes. I could see that happening. But it was practically brand new. It gently used is what you like to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> gently used. I'm not above using the yard still find. It's a repurposed. But if you are always struggling with a box grater, this one works perfect. What about the one that you used to have that you crank? Yeah, you got to put... Don't, uh, it does work and it works fast, but you got to cut your cheese into the size that'll fit into there. And then it gets clogged real easy and... Olive Garden style. Yeah, it's yeah. Olive Garden style. I've always you used to have one of those. I've always wanted the one that goes into your KitchenAid mixer that you can just like put stuff in. And I think you just drop the blocks in and it'll just keep spitting out the grapes Grater. for you. Really? You got to be into some serious grated cheese business <laughs> to need something like that. To pull that. out the mixer. Yeah, yeah. who wants to pull out that heavy stand mixer? Oh, mine just sits on the counter. So oh, I'm no, like, you can't do that at our house. <laughs> we don't like stuff on the counters. <laughs> She all has to have a place for it. You and that thing is heavy, too. I mean, if you've never toted around one of those, they're not the lightest thing. Uh-uh. We, I got the regular one and the big one. I do have the air fryer out on the counter. That don't bother you too bad. You use it a lot, though. Yeah. If you did more bacon, I'd leave the... <laughs> Maybe that's why I don't use it very often. I don't do much bacon. So I do have a sausage grinder for it. It makes a heck of a sausage grinder if you're just doing a pound or something. So that's what I wanted to know. Does it attach to the front of your KitchenAid? I think it goes on like the top part yeah. where the attachments go or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So you put it on there. It's kind of a, it kind of probably looks like a meat grinder or something. Like it kind of sticks the up the top and you I've just seen put, it. You put the little blocks in the top and it literally, like I think you can refine like how big you want your grates and you just drop it in and it just keeps spitting it out. It has like a, ro- a wheel looking thing with the grate. The grates on it. Yeah. Just like your little handheld one. And it just turns it as you feed it. Like uh, the motor turns it. It's like awesome. shoots it out. It's like uh, that salad shooter. I thing. want one. I'm gonna have to buy hey, that for our secret Santa. That for Christmas to go with that's a stuff. great Christmas. The cheese grater. You want the pasta maker too? They have a pasta maker. Yeah, I'm not gonna be making no pasta. <laughs> I can buy pasta. <laughs> Who are we kidding? Yeah. <laughs> dried pasta is pretty easy. You can buy the pasta that's not dried, and like I've, we've never tried it, like the Bertoli. Oh, it's oh, delicious. Yeah. Yep. Uh, is it? That's I. We live by that. Like I will not buy dry pasta unless they have. I can't remember what the. There's a blue box that they just started selling in grocery stores that is, like, awesome. And it's a little bit more expensive. It's probably, like, $3 a box. But, anyways, the uh, fresh, like, Bertoli pasta is the way to go. Like, yeah. linguine, fettuccine. We've yeah, never that, tried it. Yeah. We, we buy whatever it is. Like, oh, private selection Kroger is pretty good. That's what I try to buy. But most of them it's the Ronco or <laughs> whatever Ronco, the cheap yeah. brand is. It just has, like, a bite to it that. Yeah. The dry pasta can't, like, you can't replicate that. Yeah. I don't have enough vowels in my, well, I do have two in my last name, Tyler, but <laughs> to know that difference in pastas. Um, today, I wanted to talk to you about something. <laughs> it's something that I struggle with a lot, and you seem to be pretty good at it. What is it? Slicing against the grain. Oh, against the grain cutting? Yeah. That mean. I don't say I'm pretty good at it. I, you know, I do okay because I, I learned. But there's early videos of me probably butchering <laughs> some stuff across the grain. Not and so it depends on the cut of meat. Like a lot of times, um, it's easy to tell which way the muscle's running. But some cuts, like a picanha, for instance, isn't always the easiest yeah. way to tell how the grain's running, or a tri tip even. So there's some cuts that make it a little more challenging, but. The best thing you can do, like if you if you want to figure out how to slice across the grain, is you got to pay attention to it when the meat's raw, when you can see the muscle striations and which way those fibers are running, and then you make a note or either you start you go ahead and make you a like what I do a lot of times when I'm trimming, 
I'll make that first cut when it's raw. And that way it'll be, that'll continue like my line. Notch. Yeah. yeah, like I'll notch off the front of the brisket and say, okay, the grain's this way. I want to make sure when I start my flat slices that I'm cutting this way. So I'll go ahead and trim my brisket to that. That way I know that I can just come across it now, stay in line with the edge of that face, and it's going to put me across it. And that's kind but of a competition. There's, so there's even times been in videos where I've thought that I knew which way the grain was running. And I'll make my first cut, and I'll be like, uh-oh, I screwed that up. The grain's running this way. What are we going to do? Oh, we're just going to flip it, and we're going to start cutting the other way. Because, I mean, you know, you're still going to – you're not ruining it. Just don't continue slicing it with the grain. That's but how a big do you thing. know? Like, how do you – I mean, it's the muscle fiber. So what makes it, what makes it the grain is the way that that muscle, that meat's put together. Yeah. And so if you're, you understand, and you understand why it's tough, because if you slice with it, you're eating along that long muscle fiber. Well, when you cross it, you're crossing multiple and it's just a softer bite. And so there's no way to, I don't, I mean, I don't think there's a way to say, oh, I know, you know, I can tell you on every single piece of meat. You just got to look at it. Yeah. You got to look at it and see which way they're running. You know, which way they're supposed to be running, you know, when you look at a brisket or a steak or something like that, you know, but you, you wanna, know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, you would too, if you sat down and looked at it and said, okay, like, look at this piece of meat. What way does it look like that meat's laying out? Which way is it going? Which way is it running? And once you figure that out, that's the way the grains go. And that's what that means. And then you just know you got to come directly across it. Like you're cutting it in half going across. And basically. Well, yeah. And it makes it more tender. Yeah, it does. It makes your bites. It makes the meat more tender, um, and that's that's why people you know want to do it. it. Just because it's a like you can take a big difference in a slice of brisket that's cut with the grain versus taking a bite of one that's cut across the grain. The mouthfeel, the bite of it, it makes it totally different. It's tough if you don't if you cut it with that muscle is naturally tough, and cutting it with the muscle makes it a tough bite. Yeah. You're just going to increase yeah. your toughness. I just have so many problems with it. <laughs> <laughs> what about with chicken breast? Do you, do you do you try to when you're eating a piece of chicken breast? Do you think about it? Which way no. am I going to slice this chicken breast? Because I see a lot of people do it with turkey. Like you see the old, you know, everybody has this image of the man of the house bringing out the turkey and he's got the fork and he's got the knife and he's just starting to slice it off the breast around it. He's totally not. He's going with the grain that whole time to cut that turkey and to make the most tender bite. This goes for chicken too. You cut the whole breast off the carcass and you cut across because those grains, yeah, slices, because those yeah. grains of that breast are running down like from the top to the bottom. And if you're cutting with that or trying to slice over that, you're just getting long, long grains of meat, and it's a tougher bite. But when you take it off and you cut it across it. You get that's where you get those succulent pieces of turkey or chicken. And so when I'm even eating the chicken, like just the basic old chicken breast, you cook at home for dinner. And just when a, you sit it down in front of you, you're cutting. You're I'm like, turning that chicken breast sideways, and I'm gonna start at the. Usually, I start at the thin end, and I angle my knife, and I start making nice straight slices straight across mm -hmm. it, and fanning it. And as the chicken breast gets taller, you can start stand your knife up more. But I like to keep it a pretty good ratio of outside to inside meat. And so skewing that knife helps that. But I'm always going across the grain and I get this perfect. I mean, I know it probably looks stupid. When I'm sitting there eating chicken like that. But oh, yeah. It, you always make your plate look really good. Yeah. But it's fanned out. The chicken's yeah. juicy. I mean, every bite's tender. Um, so you talked, you said something about angling your cut. How important is angling a cut? Um, Do, is that something I need to be doing? Well, just if you're cutting a thin piece of meat, I like to have it. I like to give it a little more thickness by putting it on a little bias, okay. a little angle. So that's, that's what, what that it's does. for. Yeah. It's not really changing anything with the meat or anything. It just, it, your bites are about a little more uniform the way you keep them skewed. Instead of on the thin end going straight down, you got this little nothing bite. If you put a little angle on it and slice it. It'll just make a nice little piece. And as you go to the thicker part, you go more. Stand, let, let the knife stand, stand up vertical. Up. Because those pieces of meat are already thick. And if you leave them out flat, you're going to have like a deli slice if you're slicing it super thin or whatever, you know. It's, it's going to be a difference. So I like to, as the, I kind of do that with tri tip too. Yeah. As I slice a tri tip, I'll skew it down towards the thin pointy end. And as I get up to the thicker end before I'm going to turn, I'll have my knife vertical and then turn that last piece and go straight down. And you've got so you fan that tri tip out, and you've got perfect slices all the way around it. And you really see the shape of the tri tip like that too. 
So it, it just comes down to practice. I yeah, guess. yeah, it does. I mean, yeah. knife skills. I don't do that when I'm eating a ribeye steak. Usually I just. What is the grain in a ribeye? It's already cut across. Okay. When they cut those steaks, they're cutting them across. You're not eating it with it. So most steaks are cut when they trim them, but the picanha is one that's the grain can run a different kind of way. So you got to kind of watch it on it. And tri tip gets a little wonky. And tri tips just naturally like that. The grain changes in it. What, uh, any other cuts of meat that get a little wonky? Uh, what about like a flank or a skirt? They, um, Usually they're all running the same way, and those are some of the easier ones I was to tell. Say, those are usually I can yeah. tell those because you're just that's especially the skirt. You know, it's a long, thin piece anyway, super thin. So, and you always want to cut across it. There's no missing which way you cut it. But that's another one that's a really important to skew a little bit because if you go to cutting most skirt steaks just straight down, you're going to end up with the little bitty pieces like you get at the Mexican restaurants. Yeah. And it's just, a, and then there's no way to cook those medium rare. You know, they've always overcooked them and it's a little bit of shriveled up pieces. Well, if you'll take it, cook it medium rare whole first, you can nail the, the doneness of it. And then when you get ready to cut it up on the board, you take your knife and hold it skewed. You can get that longer, wider piece with it of a thin piece of meat just by holding it at that angle and cutting it. You do pretty good about yeah, and flank steak works the same way. Yep. Flank's a thin cut, and you can skew it and get a little bit taller. And even those flat irons, they're a good one to practice on learning where the grain's running and cutting it across the grain and skewing because they're not that expensive. You can get a flat iron steak for 13 14 bucks usually at Kroger. I've just, there's just been so many times that I cut into it, and I'm like, am I? Are you, are you <laughs> guessing yourself yeah. if you're doing it? Yeah. Am I? You just have Is to look this, at it. You should yeah. be able to tell, like, if you cut your slice and you pick it up and look at it and you see fibers running down the slice, it's like, man, I, you know, I shouldn't see those lines that way. It should be a lot of ends of lines, like looking at this pin, just yeah. all the way, you know, because you see the cross cut. It shouldn't be straight lines on your slice. If you're cutting the straight lines, you need to rotate that meat 90 degrees and cut, then make your cut. I think that might be just practice. A little bit, yeah. If you start paying attention to it, you'll see it. You probably just don't really pay attention to it. Sounds about right. <laughs> now I think it would be a good time to talk about blue plate. Yeah. Man, did you see the mayonnaise pie? I got something for you to talk about blue plate. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to work this recipe out. It had a buttery Doritos crust and just a good inch and a half, two inches of a mayonnaise pie. How do you think that is? It wasn't just mayonnaise. It wasn't just like, I thought they just slicked off a tub of blue plate in it. I actually went and looked, first of all. Because I was saying shell would be all over that. <laughs> if it was Fritos and mayonnaise. <laughs> Fritos and, hey, that sounds very good. Uh, first of all, blue plate is like the best mayonnaise on the planet. Hashtag spread the love. If you're choosing blue plate, if you're choosing mayonnaise this weekend, choose blue plate. Secondly, the pie, the mayonnaise pie. They had made... The crust, like you said, it was just butter and Doritos. So I, so let's go with that first. Let's okay. break that down. How do you make a Doritos crust? <laughs> okay. Is it like graham crackers where you take all your Doritos and mash them all up? That's what they did, yeah. And then melted butter. Yes. And you mix all that up, and it kind of makes this mushy stuff, and then you take it in a pie plate, a grease pie plate, like butter the pie plate a little. I, I don't know if they gave that stuff. And then you just press it all in it and come up the sides, right? I don't know if this was a professional operation. I'm gonna, but... We're going to do this. We're going to do this. is a good Halloween one. <laughs> you would really trick or treat somebody on that. You want a piece of pie? So they baked that part. Do you do bake that? They you baked that par part. Par-bake the crust a little bit. Set that. Well, like, there's no par-baking. That, that, that's it. Oh, okay. That's the only cooking. <laughs> yeah, because you cook the mayonnaise and you got an oil slick. <laughs> so they <laughs> baked that. Work. Yeah, they baked that crust. And then they took, now this is the video I saw. They took man, water and some sort of gelatin. And added that to the mayonnaise. Like sure gel. Like you're going to make jelly. Yes. Okay. Whipped it up. Warm water bit. and sure gel. Mayonnaise. And mayonnaise. Blue plate. Rip, whipped it up real good and poured it in that pie crust and then just let it set. That is the nightmare of icebox freezer pies I've ever heard. <laughs> it's just gross, isn't it? Did they do anything else to it? No. And see, I think it needs seasoning. <laughs> you, you need something. <laughs> it, it needs something. I don't know if it needs chicken or beef or we got to do something else, man. We just can't have. <laughs> it was true to a it. Loaded mayonnaise pie. 
It wasn't loaded mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> it was a load of mayonnaise. Pie. <laughs> so if I did this and made it and got it to set, could cut it out, would you try it? Oh, yeah, i try it. We're doing it, Tyler. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I really think I could make a good mayonnaise pie. Now, my mayonnaise pie is going to be You're just going to have tomatoes. And no, no, it's not. I'm thinking yeah. about making a sweet version. I've done mayonnaise in a dessert before. I've yeah, done the, the, the chocolate cupcakes. That's what the, I thought the, this was. I thought yeah. this was going to be sweet. So that's what I imagined. When you said something about a mayonnaise pie, I was thinking, well, I've heard of buttermilk pie. You know, and so why yeah. couldn't you use mayonnaise to do something like that? And so that's what I was thinking. I was like, okay, they made like an – have you ever had one of those – it's like a – I don't know. They used to show up at potlucks all the time. It was like a light fluff pie where it would be almost like Cool Whip and maybe yeah. some fruit, and then it was in this graham cracker or, pie shell. and yeah. Or they'll use a, a concentrate, like a flavored concentrate yeah. with Cool Whip and whip it really good. That's what it kind of looked like. Ambrosia pie or whatever that's called. That's what I was thinking you were making. And I was like, oh, they're going to sweeten it up, and it probably has a tablespoon or something of mayonnaise or, you know, just to give it some creaminess, but no. <laughs> no. I could see a mayonnaise cheesecake. Like, I could put – because you put eggs in cheesecake, right? Yeah. Why would mayonnaise not work? I mean, would the oil mess it up? I'm what if you were doing a no-bake mayonnaise cheesecake? You got cream cheese, you got mayonnaise. I don't know what else you goes. You're in getting there. a little too out there. <laughs> I'm coming up with this. You can pull this out your uh, pull out your KitchenAid mixer and get to. Uh, I'm not gonna need that. I'm just need one big spoon, <laughs> one big wooden spoon. Is all I need to whoop with. So talking, so talking about um, recipes, I got a couple questions from the community to ask you. I thought this one was really good. They were they're making barbecue baked beans. They want to add bacon. Do they oh, cook yeah. the bacon beforehand or do they add it raw? It depends on who you are. Because Shell will just lay some old raw bacon on top of those beans and cook them, but I don't like it. I like to always go ahead. So what I do is I'll cut my bacon. They call them lardones, but it's just little pieces. And I'll brown those off and make me some bacon drippings. And I'll pull that, the bacon pieces out, put them in a paper towel. And then I'll saute my vegetables in that bacon drippings. And then, you know, good, get yeah. the excess off because you're flavoring, you're softening up those vegetables. You're getting some of that essence of the bacon, the renderings in your vegetables. And then go to building your beans. Um, I don't, this is the bacon, the raw bacon in the beans goes back to that over the top chili thing we talked about last week. Yeah. Where you're putting, excess grease in your dish do you really want that in there because you want the flavor of the bacon you want all that it gives but without that greasiness that's gonna sit on top or give you a waxy mouth feel when it gets cold that's what that's what i don't want in my beans so i'm a i'm a cook my bacon first and, and use the drippings to soften my veg do you add like that I, cooked bacon back to the bacon? Oh, definitely definitely I want it to cook down. How hard? How hard of a cook do you give that? Bacon? I don't. It's not. I'm not trying to do crispy fried bacon. Like breakfast bacon. Yeah, yeah. I like using the thick cut bacon when I do this, and I'll render it down to where it's just, you know, it's it's past that raw stage. It's probably turning pink. It's not really browned a whole lot. Some of them, might, some of the smaller pieces might brown up, but most of it's still kind of chewy bacon. That way, I've still got some bacon flavor, and it'll cook down in mm -hmm, my beans. It mm -hmm. won't just go. And I'm not just putting crunchy bacon in my beans because that wouldn't be too good because that would it probably get hard yeah it probably would or it cook away you wouldn't get much of it i mean so I, I like a pretty good chunk you know i cut it into say one inch you know one inch pieces when i slice the bacon i usually use about six to eight strips that'll be my lardones i cook down and then use the grease from that i'll pour out i only use how much bacon drippings you need like if that renders out a ton of fat just take you a couple tablespoons out and then, you know, dump the rest in your baking grease keeper and saute your vegetables in a couple tablespoons. I like the idea of using the fat to saute the veg mm. and add that then, then actually adding the fat to the dish. To, yeah, yeah. I do the same thing with chili or now, there's spaghetti, some, yeah. anything like that. There's sometimes I'll add a little baking grease to it, like turnip greens. They're going to get a spoon. <laughs> They're going to get a spoon of baking drippings. Or black eyed peas or something like that. They need it, but uh, you know, and a spoon ain't gonna hurt you anyway. I mean, that's just flavor. It ain't gonna make it too greasy. Have you ever added it to like a dish with meat? 
Uh, bacon fat, like bacon yeah. drippings? Yeah. I'm sure I have. Have you ever used it when cooking? Yeah. Like, no, like, w- let's say smoking. Like, you oh. know how you've used tallow before? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've, I'm sure I have, like, oh, oh on steak. Oh, that's a I've good ru- I've, We've took bacon, we've took bacon, rendered bacon fat, and then rubbed it on the outside of steak and seasoned it and then cooked the steak to give some of that, that it's, Flames up on you pretty bad. I wouldn't say it's the best <laughs> thing I've ever done. I've done it though. Um, I I've used it on deer meat. You know, I've, I've, I've yeah, put I a could bacon see spoon. That. I've, I've for like bacon deer burgers. I've put a big tablespoon of bacon grease in my raw meat and mixed it up, and then just to get some flavor in there. It's pretty good because it the deer needs a little fat. Yeah, I use a tablespoon of mayonnaise sometimes too. I don't have bacon grease. Um, I know we ha- we have a friend. Who may or may not be a world champion barbecue cook who adds a little scoop to his uh, rib wrap or used to be, used to add a little scoop to his rib wrap. Mojo style. I know exactly <laughs> who you're referring to. I don't know. He used to he used to add a little bacon bacon grease to his ribs and then wrap. I wouldn't have shared a secret, but I'm pretty sure he's done a recipe where he done it. He yeah. did it, yeah. You know they got that product called bacon up, and a lot of people use that for flat top. Uh-huh. So it's basically like Crisco. Bacon flavored Crisco, or you know, is what it looks like to me. It comes in a tub, and people will scoop that out and use it on their blackstone or flat top griddle to instead of using like world butter or you know oil or something like that. So Have you ever tried it? I never tried it. I don't like a fake bacon flavor. That's what worries me with some of that stuff too. Does it got that imitation bacon bit flavor? Because that's yeah. not a good flavor. Mm-mm. I mean, I think. Bacon is one of the better flavors on oh, the yeah. planet. If you need that, that's easy. Just go buy you some Bright's bacon and then cook it low and get all the render all the grease off of it. I've got this metal, I've got it like the stove at the farm, the stove at the house has them on there and it probably I don't know how old these things are. Does bacon grease go bad? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess eventually if you don't use it, but yeah. who don't use it? But it's a metal can and at the top of it it's got like this little filter screen. And you pull the top off. And you just pour your bacon grease in it, and it filters out all the debris, and your grease goes down to the bottom. And you can wash the top off every once in a while, you know, the little bits and pieces. But it keeps good, clean bacon grease down in it. And if you leave it sitting on your stove, and if, you know, in the morning, it's usually coagulated back up or whatever. You know, it's solid. And then when it, as the stove heats up your cooking stuff, it'll be liquid, and you just get you a spoon of it out as you need it. Have you ever fried egg and bacon oh, grease? Yes, yes. It's so good. Really good. It makes all vegetables good. <laughs> Animal fat is good for you. I don't know where we got on this thing. Animal fats are bad for you. Animal fats are good for you. And they're delicious. And they are. So we had a lot of people asking about jerky. They want to know how you do jerky. Oh, I've got a couple of recipes I do. Most, um, I mean, I usually do a marinade. Um, so whatever I'm making depends on what flavor. I mean, I've got several different recipes that I do, but you know, something kind of like an Asian style or kind of like a more traditional style. It's kind of almost like a steakhouse marinade or something like that. Mm-hmm. What um, cut of meat do you use? I know you use deer a lot. Yeah, most of the time it's deer. It's a and it's a ba- uh, hind quarters of deer. The ro- you know, we we part out muscle out our roast and then cut those up thin strips. But I've bought um, top round. Uh, London Broil makes really good jerky. If you can find, if you can ever catch a London Broil cut on sale, it makes a really good jerky. Wow! Uh, just because it's a, it's the right thickness for a slice, and it's it's almost like a flat of brisket that cut, you know. So it's a, I guess it's a steak cut. We had this discussion on podcast before about yeah, what London yeah. Broil is, but it's it's a uh, uh, it's real lean. It doesn't have a lot of fat because I don't like my jerky to have a lot of fat. Some I've, here lately, I've been seeing people, you know. Dehydrate fat. Well, I don't. I don't trust it. I don't like that. I don't want to chew on that. So that's not my cup of tea. So. What do you mean they they're dehydrating? Well, like fat? a rib. They'll take a ribeye and cut up ribeye to jerky and use that. You know, they just it, the fat's got gotcha. too much moisture. It's not going to dehydrate right on your dehydrator or if you're doing it smoking at right tips. I don't think it'd be good. So I use a lean, any of the lean cuts. But you could. I mean, you could use any lean cut of beef really. Um, I mean, with jerky, jerky gets expensive. So, you know, you try to, usually we try to keep it on budget cuts. That's why I'll use like a bottom round or a top round or something like that. Or, uh, you know, chuck roast wouldn't be great for making jerky just because it's got so much marbled fat in it. So you just want to use something like sirloin steak would work. Um, and so you get it and you slice it thin. Yeah, you slice it thin. 
Uh, if you're going the marinade route, uh, you just mix up a I mean, usually it starts with some dry seasoning, so I'll use typical salt, sugar, uh, seasonings that go in it. Um, then usually Worcestershire sauce, maybe a little balsamic. You've got uh, steak two. Marinade. I've got some recipes out really there good for mar- it. Yeah. I'll, um, Jerky marinade. Yeah. I mean, I, I've done it all different kinds of ways. Just throw whatever in there and see how it goes. This is jerky. You know, just play with flavors. Um, I have done. There's a lot of great kits out there where you can buy seasoning. Uh, sometimes I use the the pink salt. Sometimes I don't. Just depends on how fast we're going to eat the jerky. Most of my jerky does not last long. I'm like, when we make it, it's eight or, get, or give it away within a week. So it's not like I'm trying to get chef stability out of it. So I don't use that pink salt all the time. But if I buy one of those kits and it's got it in there, I'll use some of that, uh, you know, mix it in. A lot of those, it's just like you pour the dry seasons to it, add that pink salt, tumble it a little bit, or mix it up with your hands or in a bag. Set it in the refrigerator overnight. The next day, get it out, shake the excess moisture off, and dehydrate it or put it on the smoker. There's no uh, – I mean, it's really easy. It's super easy. What do I don't you- like the kind that you grind up and do in the gun. I don't do that kind of jerky. I, I, we've tried it before. I just don't like the consistency of it. I don't like the texture either. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't like it. Every bite's kind of the same. and Yeah, it's just not good. It's, it reminds me of a dog treat or something. <laughs> you know, the Oberto jerky. I don't like that Oberto. <laughs> Give me Old Trapper or Jack Leaks or something if I'm buying some jerky, you know. What about Slim Jims? How do you feel about that? Ah, that's different now. <laughs> meat stick's different. I don't mind the texture of a meat stick. Well, like you think they cut meat them. sticks with the grain or against the grain? <laughs> <laughs> that's a mystery there. Sometimes you get them, it's got a big long something, and you don't know what it is. <laughs> do you prefer smoking or dehydrating your Smoking. Jerky? Dehydrator works. Like if, if I, you know, I, I used to dehydrate a bunch of it until I started cooking them on pellet grill. And then there's just nothing like letting it go low and slow on the pellet grill, trying to keep that pellet grill about 180 and letting it go for about six hours. You had some big old dusty old dehydrator that you hauled around. Oh, I had it for years. That was oh, one of the things oh. I had when you found me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've got like a Viking's helmet, <laughs> jerky dehydrator, <laughs> some big old stereo speakers. I like that when you found me. <laughs> he was sitting on the side of the road. <laughs> Free to get home. And you were like, I'm going to turn you into a YouTube star. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Now, I've never played around with making like pork jerky or, mm. or turkey jerky or any of that stuff. I've had some of it. It's okay. I'm just a little skeptical about heat heat to it. <laughs> you know, how much, how much temperature do you need to take that to to... For it to be safe. I've never oh. researched jerky making or anything like that. I just do it. <laughs> it's like we always shot deer. We always made deer jerky. And then when we didn't have deer, we wanted to make some jerky. We'd use beef. How yeah. would you like, how do you store it or? Ziploc bag. <laughs> 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 That's, uh, usually I'll get a box of gallon Ziploc bags and take it all up. And then I'll divide it out with my buddies or whoever I'm making jerky for. We, I mean, you know, deer camp. There's always some jerky sitting around. That's what you grab when you go sit in a stand. Mm-hmm. Or when we go to barbecue contest, I'd take some deer jerky, be a way to snack on it in the trailer. Here lately, we've been making summer sausage. Oh, man, it's so good. I can't wait to make some fresh summer sausage here in a few weeks. Y'all summer sausage is we got it. Me and Mikey figured it out. Good. Y'all did one that had jalapeno and cheese in it. It was real good. It was as good as anything you get, better than most stuff yeah. you get in the store. And it was deer and pork fat. That was it. Deer and pork fat. Where do you buy pork fat? Did you buy it? Well, my mom and dad slaughtered that hog and gave me a bunch of the back fat off of it. But then we also end up having to get oh, yeah. some from the home place pastures. I think they. But sometimes you can find these, you know, butcher shops that'll that'll sell you fat trim or whatever. But the thing with the the deer meat, it goes. It's better than using beef fat to me. Beef fat doesn't melt like like pork fat does, so you don't get as good a flavor, good a consistency. You can use beef fat, but from what us playing with it, port fat always did better. The 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 mouth feel of it, the way it melts uh, when you cook it, even when you're making like deer burger that you add some fat to, or 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 like breakfast sausage. We do a lot of like ground breakfast sausage with it. We use pork fat for that too. Did you happen to see on the community where someone had done a smoked beef short rib ragu? No, but that sounds delicious. It- Look delicious, Tyler. What's a what's a ragu? <laughs> <laughs> he's our Ital- Italian. Yeah, he's my resident Italian. 
<laughs> I'm Portuguese. Um. <laughs> close enough. Close enough, Tyler. Wow. It's closer to Italy than I've been. I actually don't know what a ragu is. Like, I don't, I have like something visioned in my mind, but I don't Hold know on. exactly. Is it a red sauce? I know. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, look, I mean, we, so we looked at what a bolognese was last week. It's like a meat sauce. So what is a ragu? Um, a ragu is a meat-based sauce that is commonly served with pasta. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. That's a meat sauce. Yeah. What's the difference of that and a bolognese? I don't know. Oh. So here's one. What's a prego? Because I knew the two brands was ragu and prego. <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I think bolognese is more like a gravy. Like it cooks maybe a little bit longer, and then ragu maybe is a little thinner. While ragu and bolognese are similar, and in fact, bolognese is a form of ragu, there are a few di differences. Ragu sometimes includes vegetable chunks, um, and a properly prepared bolognese does not. That's what my granny always made. She called it goulash. <laughs> okay. I've heard she it called started that. with a jar of ragu. <laughs> 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 when she put all kinds of vegetables, and it always have some meat in it of some court, but it was basically a red sauce with meat and vegetables. Uh, so is that what a ragu is? A red sauce with meat and vegetables? Ragu and some it, it doesn't have to, but doesn't have to be red. Uh, like I'm assuming based? it has yeah, to be. Yeah, I'm betting it does too. So they did it with a short rib. Yeah. And um ragu uses red wine, bolognese is white. Okay. Typically. So I like to fortify with the red better anyway. Yeah. So they do you remember when you did that short rib? I've done short ribs with red wine and then the tomato did paste. The whole reduction. And then broke it down, and man, that's so good. Served over, I like it over mashed potatoes, but do they do it over pasta? They did it over pasta, like the thick. Did they noodle. have chunks of the short rib, yes, or they were they like take them off and shred them? So they smoked the ribs, yeah, kind of like you did. Smoked them, got some color on them, and then they sauteed up their veg: carrots, onion, celery, mushrooms, garlic, and a little resi residual beef fat. And then they added in their tomato paste, parsley, and thyme. Um, that's it. Yeah. They added like garlic. Yeah. Then they added, um, you know, whole tomatoes, some red wine, some beef broth, uh, and then kind of the carrots. Yeah. They had carrots in there. Let that cook down. Um, then they shredded the ribs and placed them into the sauce and let that all cook down. And then they just served it over, uh, they called it a, they they're served over pasta. I can't you remember. Got pap Papardel Papardelli. Yes. I think it's you got you got me hungry there. What is <laughs> what is, is a Papardelli a wide noodle? Yeah. 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 A wide fresh noodle. How'd you know that, Tyler? I know all my most of my <laughs> I, thought, I thought Tyler always told me he was Italian. I don't know he's Portuguese. Well, like when I was younger, so my last name's Caravalho. Okay. When I was stepping up to the All Star plate, they called me Tyler Caravioli, and then after that, it just stuck. So Caravioli. everybody, everybody's always thought I was Italian after Tyler, that. Tyler Ravioli. <laughs> Yes, sir, but I, I do like love that. you like that, Tyler Ravioli coming up to bat. <laughs> <laughs> I was a fat kid, so it didn't. Yeah, <laughs> it was better than that, a meatball. <laughs> uh, we got spaghetti meatball. <laughs> hey, meatball, you going to hit the ball? <laughs> yeah. I feel your pain there. But I love pasta, so <laughs> I'll own that you part of care. the Italian yeah. heritage. That's right, that's right. So, Malcolm, me and you are about to hit the road. We are. We're going over to Roswell, Georgia, once again, to the Royal Oak headquarters for the Royal Oak Invitational. So, what is the Royal Oak Invitational? Um, so, Royal Oak, they do a really good job with their ambassador program where they, have, they, they sponsor teams all across the country, you know, of course, with charcoal and cooking products and all that. For uh, And most of them are uh, competition teams. And so, they give them – I don't know, pallets of charcoal, whatever they need to cook for the whole year. Well, every – they started this four or five years ago yeah, as couple, far as it was before COVID, the Invitational. Yeah. They, they wanted to do another thing where they got all the Royal Oak – the top Royal Oak teams that they sponsor together for a big Royal Oak-only contest. And so they invited their best teams. And I don't know, how many do they have? It's 40 some teams. It's usually a like big that. contest. Yeah, it's they, a big deal to get They're doing an SEA cook and they're doing a KCBS cook. And they do some other stuff too. And, they, and they, this is really, they have all their employees at their home office come out. And so they do a big dinner, like potluck dinner on Friday night for them. There's usually a band or music or something, the DJ or something going on. It's, it's a pretty big event there in Roswell. Yeah, it's really cool. But yeah. Um, I don't, it's not, 
It's not open to the public. Though. You can't uh, if you're there. You can't just show up. They'll take you to jail. I imagine <laughs> <laughs> they got security. Don't they'll take. I don't know what they do. They'll probably just ask you to yeah. leave. But yeah, yeah just tell them you're with us. <laughs> <laughs> we know the we know the big guy. He heard it on a sh- talk show. So what are you going to demo? Are you going to demo I'm, some steaks? You're going to go demo some ribs? I'm taking all kind. Of, I'm taking a bunch of vodka <laughs> and some limes and some lemons. And some lemonade and limeade concentrate and some Sprite and some bullfrog cups. And that's what we're doing. We're going to get people hopping. <laughs> when they hopping on the bullfrog. So how'd that come about? Did they say, we want you to... Did you Craig, want- the ninja, asked me. He said, man, you want to come over and do a demo or something for everybody? Uh, he said, how about you come and just make bullfrog for everybody? And I said, done. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that is something I can get behind right there. Now, I, I mean, people see me cook on the you know on yeah. the YouTubes everywhere. On the YouTube. But uh, they don't ever get to see me make drinks for the public, so I'm going to make some drinks. It sure is a lot easier to carry some Sprites over to Georgia yeah, than... That's right. Than ribs, seasonings, knives. Yeah. Hey, everything you got to take with that, a grill. A I don't grill, even have to take a charcoal, grill. Yeah. There's going to be plenty of that over there. I mean, they're cooking, like Craig usually cooks... They usually cook a hog. They, I mean, they usually, they cook all kinds of stuff. Sometimes he cooks gators. So there's going to be a bunch of food over there. I mean, it's going to be a good time. So hey, we're going to drive over there... First thing tomorrow, and then we'll be back till Sunday. Another weekend gone. <laughs> I got some special. Uh, I'll get no chili frog. this weekend. Yeah, no chili this weekend. I got some special bullfrog cups we're taking with us. Yeah. What they, do they say? Drink more bullfrog. I'll drink more bullfrog. <laughs> <laughs> you should have brought the frog in here and set him on the podcast. Oh, yeah. I, I need a guy in a frog, you know, like the Froggy 94 suit. If, like, if we could have took one of those and had him stand up there beside me. I'm sold. Tyler, <laughs> Tyler, how do you feel about putting on a frog suit? I got it. <laughs> what are your weekend plans? What are you weekend? You're like a run to Atlanta? Abandon your wife and children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she'll be fine. <laughs> she'll be all right. We got Ole Miss playing Auburn. Saturday night. I'll probably oh, try yeah. to find how's, a place to watch that. How's your fantasy football and your betting and all that going for they're, you? They're doing, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm all right. You having a good season? I, I me, think the Grizzlies start here this week, don't they? <laughs> I was going to say, me and Malcolm are fighting for last place in our league. Right oh, really? Now. No, like for real. Like, I suck. God. What about the other league you're in? I'm holding my own in it. I'm like okay. fifth Okay. out of 12. So that's not bad. I'm in the playoffs over there. If I mean, we still got yeah. a long way to go. My problem is every single one of my guys are hurt. Yep. Like same. and Tyler's in the same boat. So when you look at our bench, like we're scrambling to find somebody to plug in just to play because everybody else is hurt. And at this point, there's nobody. I don't care how good a person you are picking up people on the waiver wire. There's nobody left. Nope. Everybody snatched them all up, and then nobody wants to. I mean, I don't have anything to trade, so I'm just I'm just a dead man walking out there. You know. Everybody keeps trying to trade me for Saquon Barkley, and I keep saying no. And I'm, I'm a, I think the next person that asks is getting the yes. Getting, I keep yeah. holding on to him, like he's coming back this week. He's coming back this week, and he hasn't. I, yeah, but I, my teams are horrible. I don't know if everybody's having a bad year as me, and, and I don't bet no more. No, I, don't. <laughs> 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 I learned my Since lesson. When? <laughs> I don't know. Is Kid Georgia the DraftKings working Georgia? I, don't think I, so. I might make a comeback. <laughs> DraftKings not working in Mississippi saves me a lot of money because if I was like, you can go across the Tennessee state line and it works, but I'm not going to drive up there just to place a bet. Yeah. I mean, you have before, but. <laughs> yeah. I got to really want to bet on something. Uh, There's nothing I really want to bet on. I don't feel that good. I'm, Braves I'm, let me down. Braves let me down too. Yeah. Last time I bet, they were part of my parlay and they were the ones that. Busted it. Yeah. They let a lot of people down. <laughs> the Braves let the Braves down. They're like, hold on, how do we win 100 games and then get put out by the first round? Well, That's, I, I think I'm done betting, too. I yeah. had, I've, when, I first, when I first started, I was like, this I is got a good easy. Feeling. I, 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 here's my thing. I got a, <laughs> I got a great – I'm pretty dead set, 100% sure that my Vikings are going down this week, playing the 49ers. I don't know. So, Everybody thought last week they were going to go That's true. That's true. Nobody thought that the Jets would beat the Eagles and who beat the 49ers. The Browns beat the 49ers last week. I'm glad I didn't bet on those because I would have had them the other way. <laughs> you just never know, man. It's got to be all rigged, right? Well, I'll let you uh, go and let you have time to think about these bets <laughs> for your weekend. I'm not betting. <laughs> I'm not betting. <laughs> As soon as we cross the state line, you're going to check that draft. <laughs> <laughs> the steam over there refreshing it. Yes. 
<laughs> I don't know if it works in Georgia or not. Some states you go in and it don't work. So. You are going through Alabama. Alabama. It doesn't, it doesn't work in Alabama. Okay. Doesn't work in Arkansas. It works in Tennessee. I think if a state has gambling, it won't work. Okay. But on states that don't have gambling, like I don't know if Georgia has casinos, do they? I don't, it might I don't, work there. I didn't know Alabama did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Malcolm, that's all I have for you today. All right. Well, Tyler, you want to tell everybody about the community and where they can find us and all that good stuff? Yeah, if you guys want to join a group of like-minded, awesome people, pitmasters, backyard cooks, etc., make sure you all head on over to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash H2Q community. All weekend long, you can share your recipes. You can check out what other people are cooking, like the ragu that Shell was talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about your recipes over here. We'll answer your questions as many as we can get to, and there's lots of awesome yeah. giveaways. So. I want to try that ragu recipe. All right, Shell. Well, you got anything else you want to add? If you'd like to connect with Malcolm, it's How To BBQ Right on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and, of course, YouTube. If you'd like to connect with me, it's Miss Southern Shell on Instagram. All right. Well, we appreciate you all hanging out with us today here at How To Barbecue Right, the podcast, and we will be back next week to discuss more barbecue stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we gone.